I was working as a consul in Montreal. And if you've never been in the State Department, everyone serves as a consul sooner or later, mostly sooner. It's your first assignment. They send you off to the Dominican Republic or Seoul, Korea, or someplace where people are just waiting in long, long, long lines to get visas to come to the United States. And you have about a minute to decide, I'm going to give this person a visa or I'm not. And you do that for eight hours a day. It is visa hell. Well, I was in Montreal, which is a little bit better. It's a lovely place in the summer. Um, but I wasn't really having that great a time, and my boss came in, and this was in the days when the, the morning read traffic was not on the computer, it was still in paper. And he slams this big stack of paper on paper clip together on the desk and says, you should read this first one. And it said, volunteer cable. And that is code in the State Department for we need people so badly that your boss can't argue. If you'll go, we'll take you. And I was like, like you'd let me go. And he shrugged and said, yeah, well, we'd think about it. The guy in front of me could have been Osama bin Laden. I would have given him a visa because I was so happy that I had a chance to get away from this place. That's not, I would not have given Osama, just for the record. <laughs> we knew who he was even then. I would not have personally given him the visa. But I, Mr. Singh, who was in front of me, did get his visa that day. So I called up and I said, hey, I will go to Kosovo. And the guy on the other end of the line, who has become a dear friend of mine, um, said, you're my new favorite person. So I went to Kosovo, and I have to admit to you that um, I didn't know what Kosovo was. I had no idea where it was. I didn't know what the word meant. I knew nothing about the place. But I wanted to go somewhere else, and so I was happy to go. There was a war going on between the Kosovo Albanians and the Serbians, and people were killing and dying every day. And I was happy to leave Montreal, but I really didn't know at the time what I was getting into. And I was assigned to a small team of a dozen Americans, six foreign service officers and six military officers. And we rode around in these big, heavy, up-armored suburbans with young Albanian, Kosovar Albanian women who worked as our translators. And the task was to serve as a military observer. The implied task was stop the killing. And I was supposed to go for two months. I ended up staying for two years, um, from July of 1998 till the late spring of 2000. If you read war literature, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, at some point early on in the story, there's a moment where the protagonist encounters war dead for the first time. Every story has this. Every war story is like this. Because it is a passage from one state of being to another. The person is profoundly and permanently changed the first time you see war dead. And this will be in every novel of war, every story of war. There's that moment when it happens. Lying in a tangle of limbs under a blue UN tarp on a trailer that only a week before had carried papers and corn to the market in Malashevo. Only parts of their bodies were visible. I couldn't see all of their faces. One had an arm resting across her forehead. One had a bandage covering most of her head. One of the dead was missing, an 18-month-old child. We'd seen some dogs on the way up the trail. Morgan Morris, the dauntless UN refugee field officer who'd led us to the scene, said what all of us were thinking. The dogs probably got the body. We had just seen the mother resting in a house in a village a couple of kilometers away. She had a bullet lodged in her upper arm. The bullet had passed through her baby, then through her breast before lodging in her arm. The father said the baby was killed instantly. The bullet tore the child in half, he said. He had dragged the mother away to safety. A doctor from the Red Cross was treating her wounds in a small house in the village. There were 10 women and a 72-year-old man in one stifling, airless room of the house. All of them had been wounded in the attack. They sat silently on the floor, their backs against the walls of the room, lost in their pain and their thoughts, waiting. We came in that day to this little village, village called Senek because the UN field officer had told us there had been an attack. 
A few days before that, the Serbs had driven a tank up the road into this peaceful little village. And the people had not waited to see what would happen. Many of them had packed up their belongings on the back of trailers and driven their tractors and their Zastava cars up into this draw, a small valley not far away. And the Serbs shelled them with mortars and then sent an infantry sweep through and killed these seven women and wounded these 11 civilians. So it was our job to document this, and we drove up and stood watch while they buried their dead. I had written a crisp, dry account of a messy, horrible act of cruelty, and in doing so, I had documented a war crime. That was my first war crime. In two years in Kosovo, most of it uh, before the bombing campaign or in the immediate aftermath, we documented numerous war crimes the reporting that my team did was sent to the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, the ICTY, and was used in the prosecution of, of Sir Slobodan Milosevic. He died before he could be sentenced. But there's a special hell for people like him. So I was in El Fasher in support of a United Nations mission to organize and run a training exercise for the African Union peacekeeper staff. I was the scenario writer. The three scenarios I, I wrote were roughly like this. A humanitarian emergency develops into a security sec crisis. Deal with it. A security crisis develops into a humanitarian catastrophe, which includes significant press interest from CNN and bad weather. Deal with it. The kitchen sink of problems arrives sequentially. Deal with all of them. The Amos staff had an officer on the UN team who'd helped with the details of the scenarios. He had the plots and he knew the solutions. We also, he also gave these to his colleagues on the staff, and they still failed. They were utterly unprepared for this mission of stopping a genocide. Personally, I was failing too. I was falling apart, in some ways worse than I had in Afghanistan. I was deep into a bad PTSD episode. I was drinking myself into a stupor every night in an Islamic Republic where alcohol was banned. And I was carrying on a clandestine affair with the United Nations official. The genocide was actually diminishing, but we had no way of knowing that at the time. What I saw around me was 300,000 dead and 2.5 million displaced. I had no safety net to catch me, nor anything during the day to hold me together. I had very few actual responsibilities since the scenarios were already written. I was mostly along for the ride with the UN team. Despite this, I was managing pretty well until one very bad day. The woman with whom I'd been having an affair for a couple of months asked me what would happen after our work together ended. We'd been at it for a few weeks in Ni Nairobi, then in Addis, then in Darfur, having fun in nice hotels in Kenya and Ethiopia and dodgy guest houses in Sudan, drinking, playing. But when she started making noises about next steps, that set off alarm bells in my head, dragging me back to the realization that I had a life outside this little war zone bubble. Soon I would have to go back to that life and to the reckoning. And I was overwhelmed with a sense of futility and sadness. I'd failed to stop the wars. So many people were dead because of my failures. Images rushed at me, the 45 dead from Rajak, the raped nun from Bunia, the man with the red rim dies and his dead family. I picked up the pistol and charged it, loading a bullet into the firing chamber. My hands were shaking. I put the beer down and took the pistol off of safe. I was ready. I was sobbing and talking to myself, to the spheres, to no one. The pistol was ready. I shifted it to my left hand. I looked at it in my hand, lying partly on my lap and pointed down a bit. I took a deep breath to calm myself. Then the phone rang. It scared the hell out of me, and I jumped. I almost pulled the trigger, which would have been highly ironic to shoot myself in the foot while preparing to shoot myself in the head. I looked at the phone lying on the seat of the pickup and saw that it was my wife calling from Washington, DC. Was this serendipity, karma, luck, or just uncanny timing? With my thumb, I put the pistol back on safe and laid it on the seat. 
While I talked to Maureen for a few minutes, I stared out through the windshield and watched the sun setting over the rocky brown desert of Darfur. The ringing phone had broken the spell. After the crying and the shaking, the moralizing and the justifying, the calming of hands and nerves, the intense focus on the immediate act of charging the weapon and then taking off the safety and preparing to put the barrel into my mouth, a ringing phone pulled me back from the brink. So that day, I drove back to the Special Forces team house where I'd spent so many months. I handed the pistol off to my friend, the team sergeant. A few weeks later, I was medically evacuated home at my own request from Darfur. On my way out, I wrote a cable back to the State Department explaining how bad our policy was in Darfur. There's no one solution. Um, very often, it is diplomacy. If we're not talking to people, we can't solve the problem at all. And we've stopped talking to a lot of people these days. So the first step, I, I believe, really has to be diplomacy. And our military in its, it is magnificent. It's very tired right now. We've been fighting for 14 years. Um, and we're getting ready to go through a round where I think the pendulum's going to swing back towards isolationism. We're going to see the military shrink. Hopefully, our diplomatic corps and our USAID missions of we have about 7,000 foreign service officers. That's not enough. It'd be nice if we could increase that. We really have to talk to people before we can do anything else, I think. 